Good morning, everyone. This is Gary Alley from the Narkey Street Congregation, and this is our Shabbat service message for October 10th, 2020. This Shabbat, we've come to the conclusion of the parasha reading for the Jewish year, and Sukkot has just finished. And here in the land of Israel, two holidays are celebrated today, the biblical observance of Shemini Yatzevet and Simchat Torah, which is a rabbinic celebration for the completion of reading through the first books of Moses, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're also known as the Pentateuch. And next Shabbat, we'll start the cycle all over again for the parasha with the beginning, Breshit. It's the first six chapters of Genesis. And today, as we finish with Deuteronomy, we'll not only be looking at the last two chapters of the last book in the Torah, Deuteronomy, but the reading tradition for this Shabbat also does a taste test of the first chapter of the first book of Genesis. So the full reading for this morning is the last two chapters of Deuteronomy, 33 and 34, and the first chapter of Genesis and the first three verses of chapter two as well. So why read the end and the beginning together today at the very end of the cycle? I think it's a reminder that God's word is complete and it's holistic, yet it's cyclical and never ending. <clears throat> it's something that you can never finish. You can always find a fresh interpretation of scripture for our ever-changing lives and circumstances. You might be through with God's word, but it's not through with you. At our congregation here in Jerusalem, we are followers of Jesus, Yeshua, whom we proclaim as Messiah of the Jews and Savior of the world. And not only did Jesus quote scripture quite often, he also alluded to it even more when he taught his parables and declared his messianic calling. Rejoicing over the Torah or God's instruction has always been central to Jesus' Jewish culture. But for the millions of us non-Jewish believers in Jesus who followed him in the last 2,000 years, God's word has been also fundamental for our entrance into the family of God. In fact, you'll remember that the Apostle Paul says our faith comes through hearing, and specifically from hearing the word of God. That's in Romans 10, 17. And 700 years before Paul, the prophet Isaiah said that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law, Torah, will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's in Isaiah 2, verses 2 to 3. Notice here, Isaiah says that us Gentiles, the nations, the peoples, all ethnicities would come up to Jerusalem to receive God's word. And then we would take this teaching out to our distant homelands, whether forest, prairie, mountain, desert, jungle, savanna, lowlands, swamp, or islands. Wherever we live, God's word would be taken out. So on one hand, we can see that this prophecy has already been fulfilled through the life of Jesus and his disciples who went out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth with the gospel. But on the other hand, this prophecy, I think, is still in process. As we continue to live into this 21st century, waiting on the return of Jesus. And in fact, I would say studying God's word and finding good application for it today in our technologically 
evolving, scientifically aware world has become even more complicated for us than it ever was for Peter or John or for Paul. Yes, God's word is not an old, outdated, dusty book. As scripture says in Hebrews 4, it's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates us and judges the hearts and the attitudes of our heart. But even that idiom that we see here in Hebrews 4 of a double-edged sword needs to be understood in its ancient context. Swords were an essential weapon for war for hundreds, even thousands of years. In the time of the New Testament, the Roman double-edged sword, the gladius, was known for its versatility. It could slash, it could thrust, it could block. And this sword was considered a crucial component in Roman military success. But today, in our world, in advanced warfare, missiles and drones are quickly becoming the preferred way to deal with an enemy. No need for hand-to-hand -hand combat when you can press a button and zap someone. Our children are growing up in this world. They're playing video games that are indirectly teaching them skills for this modern form of combat. All that to say, God's word is vital for our spiritual growth, but it must be versatile for our modern spiritual warfare. A weapon is only as useful as the hands that apply it. That's why we must never stop studying and interpreting scripture. Looking at the parashah today, let's start in Deuteronomy 33. And we see immediately its theme in the first verse. Deuteronomy 33, 1. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. Notice that this chapter, Deuteronomy 33, is known as Moses' blessings upon the tribes of Israel. And by the way, if you go through and read Deuteronomy 33, you'll notice that one tribe does not receive a blessing. And I'm not going to tell you which one. You can go have some fun and figure it out yourself. But this chapter on blessings of a patriarch near his death reminds us of Isaac blessing Esau or trying to bless Esau and Jacob sneaks in. And then in Genesis 49, when Jacob blesses his sons, or when he blesses his grandsons of Joseph, or when the prophet Elijah blesses Elisha before he goes to heaven. All of these examples of blessing are a very powerful symbol where you have an elder passing on their life blessing to those who would follow in their steps. Notice, a blessing is made up of words spoken words, words that bring life, while a curse are words that ultimately wish death. Moses' blessings are words that reflect God's heart toward Israel. And Israel's blessing is because of their relationship with the Lord. The relationship is always central to any blessing. As we read here in the last verse of Deuteronomy 33, Happy are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. And so now we come to Deuteronomy 34, the last chapter of Deuteronomy. And here we have the death of Moses. In Numbers 20, you'll recall how Moses was in the wilderness with the people, and he became frustrated with the people. And he disobeyed God's word when he struck the rock for water when the people were thirsty. God had told him to speak to the rock that time. And so in Numbers 20, God punishes Moses by saying he would not be allowed to enter Canaan. So now here in Deuteronomy 34 is the culmination of that. Moses is going to die outside of the promised land. But God allowed one final mercy to Moses 
when he let him climb up to the top of Mount Nebo and to look over the entire land. Moses could see the land, but he could not touch it. His life work had been bringing his people to this point in history, but he would not get to experience their joy of entering the land. It reminds me from the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot 2.16, where it says that Rabbi Tarfon used to say, it is not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you at liberty to neglect it. So too, Moses had been a faithful servant. He had done his part in God's great plan for Israel. Moses was a great leader, and to, even today he's remembered as maybe the greatest leader of Israel. But he was only one small part in God's plan. But Moses didn't sulk or quit doing his job, even though he would not reap some great reward like entering the promised land. Joshua would take Moses' place, and he would lead the people into the land. And then after Joshua, the judges would lead. And after the judges, the kings would lead, and so on. Every generation was required to be faithful to God, to obey his word, and then to pass his word on to the next generation. Even then, God's word was a cycle it was a flame being passed on to illuminate the future generations. It was a lamp unto their feet. And now we come to Deuteronomy 34, verse 5, where it says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. This translation is from the NIV. Yes, Moses dies. And we know later in the next verse that God buries him. But in the Hebrew of verse 5, it says, Vayamot sham Moshe ebed Adonai be'eretz Moab al pi Adonai. What's interesting here is the Hebrew says that Moses died according to the mouth of the Lord, literally. While we know, like all Bible translators do, al pi Adonai is an idiom for the word of the Lord or the command of the Lord, and we know that this is referring back to Numbers 20, when God had commanded or said that Moses would not enter the land, and therefore he died outside of the land. But the interesting part here with al pi Adonai, with or through the word of the Lord, is that some later Jewish interpreters suggested that Moses literally died through the mouth of the Lord. In other words, the Lord kissed Moses, and in so doing, took his final breath away. Moses died by the mouth of the Lord. This is, you know, a very interesting uh, midrash. And so, keeping that in mind, we now come to Genesis 1 in our parasha, chapter 1 of Genesis, which we all know as the creation story. And in this first creation story here in Genesis 1, God creates the world by using his mouth. He speaks words and they create life. He says, let there be light and there is light. He says, let the water gather to one place and form the seas. And it does. He says, let the land produce vegetation. And it does. He says, let there be stars in the sky. And they are. He says, let there be creatures, and they appear in the sky, in the water, on the land. And so, too, God creates us, humanity, in Genesis chapter 1, through his words. He creates in us, or he creates us in his image. And most importantly, as God is creating the world, he's also blessing the world. You'll notice in Genesis 1.22, after he's made the great creatures of the sea and all of the things that are living inside the water and every winged bird, he says God blessed them 
And he said, be fruitful and multiply. And then in Genesis 1.28, after he creates man and woman, male and female, he blesses them. And he also says, be fruitful and multiply. Notice this full circle of life we are now witnessing here in this final parasha reading. As Moses concludes the Torah, the end of Deuteronomy, and his life is passing away, he blesses the next generation to follow him. He blesses through words of life. And then in Genesis 1, it begins again, recycling this idea of blessing that's inherent in God's creation, that our world's a gift, that God calls his creation good seven times here in Genesis 1. God's creation is a blessing, and this blessing comes through his mouth, through his words. Just as we have been created in God's image as his children, so too we are to bless and not curse. God's final blessing in the creation is found in Genesis 2, verse 3, where it says, Then God blessed the seventh day, the Shabbat, and he made it holy, because on that day he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The seventh day, today, the Shabbat, is blessed because God rested from his work, which he did with his words. Likewise, death is like a Shabbat. It's a final rest. Death can be a blessing if we approach it like Moses did, with contentment and peace in our relationship with God and not in our pride of accomplishment found in our work. Moses could have been bitter that he didn't enter the promised land. He could have felt like he deserved it, that it was his right to receive some temporal reward, but he didn't. He did not demand his way. His work was finished and he was content. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. That's in Hebrews 4. And so this is why Moses is proclaimed the humblest man on earth in Numbers 12, 3, because he was the most powerful man, but he obeyed God. And he did not use his power to get his way by forcing his way into Canaan. You'll recall when Danny opened up our series here on Deuteronomy back in July, he mentioned how the Hebrew name for the book of Deuteronomy is Devarim, or words. Because the book of Deuteronomy starts with this verse. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness. Just as Deuteronomy is a collection of words, God's word is made up of many words. He creates the world in Genesis 1 by speaking words. And he gives his covenant of the Torah to Israel through words. You remember the Ten Commandments are really the Ten Words. And words come from the mouth. You'll remember, Sharon, did a sermon where she baked a challah back in August, and she taught on Deuteronomy 8.3, where it says, The Lord humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on everything that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Most translations there in Deuteronomy 8.3 have every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Because in the Hebrew it says, which implies that what is coming out of a mouth are words. And so contentment and peace are not found in the temporal food that we put into our mouths. 
but in the spiritual food that comes out of God's mouth. Obeying God's word gives us joy. It gives us real life. And you'll remember, this is the same verse that Jesus quoted to the devil, Satan, after his 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus did not find ultimate life flowing from the things of this world, but in obeying the things that come out of the mouth of the Lord, his words. So too, Moses, after 40 years in the wilderness, found his fulfillment in obedience. And he died through God's mouth, al pi Adonai, according to his words. Just as God breathed life into Adam at his birth, back in Genesis 2, 7, likewise, God takes the life breath away from Moses at his death. The bottom line is, whether birth or death, God is in control, and his mouth, his words, can bring blessing in both moments. God's words are more than communication, whether they're spoken or they're written. They are symbols of his presence among us. His word dwells with us. Studying it, obeying it, practicing it, trying to understand how we are to interpret it, Today, in the 21st century, these are all signs of fearing God, of revering Him, of respecting Him, and ultimately of worshiping Him. No wonder John called Jesus the Word. There is no greater description of divine presence. To conclude this parasha cycle this morning would be a paradox. You can only begin again, start all over. You can never finish knowing the majesty of God and the timelessness of his word. You can never know everything about the Lord and what he wants to do in our lives. He's daily looking for a new creation in me, in you, in the darkness over the surface of the deep. And today, He's calling us to dive back into his word and learn the heart of obedience all over again. In a sense, we are just starting. As his children, we are called to be co-creators with him in this world, powerful in his spirit, but humble in our actions. Like him, we are to bless those we serve and not curse. And when our time of death draws near or suddenly takes us without warning, may his word of blessing be in our mouth and in the many of those that we have passed it on to. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. This is the word of the Lord.